Hello, my name is Bill Howland. Where and when were you born? I was born in uh, New Brunswick, Canada, April, uh, January 4th, 1925. So how old are you right now? 93. Do you feel like you're 93? Yes. Physically, what is it like to be 93? Well, I can't say that everybody is the same. I do quite a bit of, of work around the house, carrying things, cutting limbs out of trees on a ladder and things of that nature. Uh, I think I'm probably better than the average one at the same age. Um, mentally, I'm losing my memory a tad, which is not very pleasant. What branch of the service were you in during World War II? Uh, the U.S. Army. And what division, regiment, and company were you in? I was in the 36th Infantry Division, 142nd Regiment, and Company F in the 2nd Battalion. And what was your specific role in Company F? I, I was a combat medic. And tell me about the role of a combat medic. A medic is to be with a platoon. Every platoon in the infantry has been assigned in an individual medic for themselves. And they are supposed to be able to do anything that is needed when someone is injured in combat. And it, that doesn't mean anything of patching up when they get a bullet hole or when they get a limb dismembered. They have to give them blood, although we never were given blood where I was in Italy, which was terribly unfortunate. What was the highest award for valor that you received in combat? The Silver Star. Were you ever wounded? Yes, I was, but not as a matter of the Silver Star. I was wounded twice different times. Where on your body were you wounded? Well, in my leg, behind my leg, one, one place, and the other place was just a good spraying of shrapnel from an explosive artillery shell. And how were you wounded in your leg? Well, I think it was also an artillery shell, but a much bigger piece than, than the others I had. What was the highest rank you achieved by the time you left the service? It was called Technician 5th Grade. Where all did you see combat in World War II? In Italy, France, and Germany. I was a prisoner in, in near the end of the war. And how long were you a prisoner of war? Just about two months. How old were you when you first got into combat? I was uh, 18 years old. So I just want to backtrack a little bit. You had mentioned that you were born in Canada. Did you grow up in Canada? No, I didn't. My parents moved to Florida in the U.S. when I was less than six months old. And where in Florida did you grow up? In the general area in Miami. Talk to me about growing up in Miami as a kid. What kind of things did you do for fun? Well, I used to ride a bicycle with a bunch of friends when we were very young. That was the earliest thing we did. Later on, I had a sailboat, and I used to sail around on Biscayne Bay. And uh, we started doing swimming uh, in, in the Biscayne Bay and things of that nature. Did you have any brothers or sisters? Yes, I have a younger brother who's eight years my junior. So you were the only one who went overseas in the war? Yes, I was. He was later in the Navy, but not during the war. When you were growing up, before the war broke out, what were you planning on doing with your life? Well, it was pretty obvious because my father had a very successful construction company. And I knew that uh, I would be able to join that if I chose to do so. 
And that's the way I did it. Talk to me about your memories of the Great Depression. What were the struggles that your family faced during those years? Well, frankly, I was so young at that time that it didn't mean much to me. And we, we lived in a very nice house and had several cars. And my dad had his company going well. So if they had any serious personal, physical, or, or rather um, uh, money problems, they never told me about it. But were there any specific instances, things that you saw or heard around you that really made you realize there's a Great Depression going on? Well, I did realize it because people used to come to our house to try to get a job from my father. And most of them looked like they were starving to death. And my father was a very kind man. And he would always give them something whether he hired them or not. Did your father serve in World War I? Well, he did. He was a captain in the Canadian Army, but he was never sent overseas. Tell me more about the kind of childhood that you had. Uh, what kind of things you and your friends would do for fun as teenagers? Well, as teenagers, I didn't have much free time because my father sent me to Riverside Military Academy up in Gainesville, Georgia. And um, I stayed there until I graduated. And uh, at, at that time, the World War II had already started, so I knew what was going to come in the future. But before you were sent off to Military Academy, what kind of mischief would you and your buddies get into? <laughs> Frankly, n none of us were very much like that. My younger brother, years later, was was doing things like that, and he got into a pretty good bit of trouble. But um, you, he, you, fin he finally was t told not to do it. But do you remember any of the pranks that you guys would pull on Halloween or something like that? Well, I remember only one thing that I can think of. One time a friend of mine and I, both of us lived within probably a mile and a half of our high school. And we went over one night on our bicycles, dressed up to try to uh, change our appearance. And we went to the flagpole in the middle of the church area and stole the rope from the flagpole to use in our boats. <laughs> um, how old were you when you were sent to the military academy? Well, I, w I was uh, probably, I don't know specifically, but I think I probably was like 13, maybe, maybe 14. And where was it? Uh, Gainesville, Georgia. And tell me about life at the military academy. Well, it was almost like going to West Point. We all had several different types of uniforms, and we every day we would get out of bed and put our uniforms on and go out and get our positions in our own city uh, uh, companies. They divided us into squads and companies and battalions, and we were taught military uh, marching and uh, and uh, rifles bit, uh, dealing with hand hand working, and it was a very nice place, and I I did enjoy it. It was tough; you couldn't get away with anything messing around, but uh, it was good. How did you hear about the attack on Pearl Harbor? Well, we heard it uh, from the people who had radios on. We were r right there, and, and, and we were told exactly what had happened. And, of course, then we all started talking about, well, we're prepared for that more than most people are, and we knew we would be getting into the war. This was, of course, December 7th, 1941. 
and that was my senior year. I graduated the next year in uh, June of of uh, forty two, and from then I went to college until I turned eighteen and had to go into the service. But what was that like for you to hear that your country had been attacked? Well, it wasn't as surprising to us, I think, as it would have been to people who had never had any military experience at all, as we had as kids. We were, we were, we knew how to use rifles, submachine guns, and various th things that military people, as infantry, have to do. So, what college did you go to? I went to the University of Florida up in Gainesville, Florida. And how long were you there? Well, I was only there for one quarter because uh, as soon as that, I, it, it would be in January, I turned 19 and I had to go, or 18 rather, and I had to go and, and I'd sign up for being put in the military. And so, uh, after you signed up for the draft, what happens? Well, I told the people at the draft office that I wished to be a pilot in the Air Force. And uh, they told me, well, we w we'll let you take the mental and physical exams and we'll see how that turns out. They did, and they told me that I had passed both of them. But when I asked them when I would be sent and where, they said right at this moment there are no openings in any new classes, so you'll have to go at least temporarily, and we'll notify you when there is an opening that you can have. They never did. What attracted you to joining the Air Corps? Well, I loved flying, and as a matter of fact, I went and took flying lessons so that I could tell the people uh, who, with whom I was discussing getting into the Air Force, that I was a pilot to a degree already. And we traveled all the way across the desert to Tunisia, uh, where we got on another ship and then headed for Italy. And so... When you were in North Africa, how did you guys live in these boxcars? Well, they had given us enough food for the three days that it took to get across that desert, uh, and water too, of course, and every once in a while they'd stop and we could get off and go to the John or whatever we thought we needed to do. But we, can, we just moved almost continuously across the desert. It was only, as I say, something like three days. We, we landed in Naples, and uh, I, was, I was about a month and a half behind the time when Naples, or the invasion in Italy at all, was, ta was accommodated. It was, that happened on uh, September the 9th, 1943. And when did you arrive there? I arrived there probably in the middle of November. And so, take me through uh, what happens to you once you arrived in Naples. Well, what happened was they had trucks, of course, that came down to the docks, and we got off the ship and spread ourselves out in the trucks, and they took us to the uh, headquarters of the 36th Infantry Division. None of us, at least I, didn't know it was going to be any particular division, but it turned out to be the 36th, which was the one that had put the first boots on the ground in the invasion. And we all jumped off the truck and were looking around wondering what was going to happen next. Uh, we, we, they, certain people came and grabbed all the soldiers and took them to a particular location. Well, I was looking around wondering what was going to happen to me, and I noticed a medical officer standing there looking over we newcomers. And uh, he, for some reason, looked at me and motioned for me to come up to him. And I did and saluted and said, sir, he says, you see that man over there on the, on the left? I said, yes, sir. He says, give him your rifle and stand over with this group I'm collecting. 
I said, Captain, what does this consist of? He says, well, son, you were a rifleman just now, but you're now going to be a medic. And I couldn't say a word about that. I had no uh, liberty to do anything different. And that's the way it started, and that's the way it ended. Do you have any prior training in the medical field? I had absolutely none. And the sad part is, the ridiculous part is, I didn't get any even when I was selected to be one. I was on the front lines in Italy the very next day, and I, nobody had told me even how to put a Band-Aid on. Why do you believe that medical officer picked you out, out of all the other men there, what was it about you that made him decide that you would be a good combat medic? <clears throat> well, I don't think that's what his reason was. I, the only thing I've ever thought probably was the correct idea was that he thought I wouldn't be a very good rifleman because I'm small, not very heavy, didn't look very powerful. So he thought maybe he was uh, getting me relieved from something and being able to do something that he needed. How tall were you back then? 5'8". Audie Murphy was only 5'5". Five, five. Was he that low? Well, that's, uh, I'm a little taller than that right now. I've lost two inches. Yeah, but anyways, so, I, you know, at that point you were a private, right? Yes. Did you have any, uh, were you able to argue with him at all, or what he says goes? Whether I was able to or not, I can't say, but I didn't have guts enough to do it. <laughs> So, what happens to your rifle? I, I have no idea. I took it over and gave it to that guy that he pointed out to me, and I guess he would give it to somebody who had lost their rifle or something like that. And then, take me through how, after you became a medic, were you a stretcher bearer or were you a full-on medic? Well, fortunately, for the first month or, or so, I was a litter bearer, and uh, that, what that means is I was one of four guys who picked up s soldiers who had been wounded but were not able to walk, and we would carry them down the mountainside, my goodness, what a terrible thing that was, to the s station where the doctors were so they could get all the help that was available. And sometimes it was really difficult to do that because the Italian mountains where we were at that time were really rugged and steep. Well, as I said, I, I joined the 36 as a medic when uh, about the, just, just a little bit before Thanksgiving. And immediately thereafter, we headed into the mountains, which were very steep. And we were trying to approach the city of Casino, which the Germans had uh, taken before we arrived there. And they had troops in that town and also in the mountains above there. And that was one of the most difficult things. In Italy, at least the time I was there, no matter how much ground we were able to conquer and move ahead into, the Germans would find a higher mountain ab above us and still they could look down and see every movement we made. I bet they could look at our every guy digging a foxhole there and that's why their artillery was so accurate. Tell me about your first experience under a German artillery bombardment. Well, the first one uh, was I wasn't out in the open, the first shell I heard that came near me. We were, as, as the litter bearer squad, squad, we were supposed to stay near the captain uh, in the headquarters of our company. And they happened to have been in a house, uh, and it was in the winter, of course, and the mountains we were on at that point were snowy. And we had found a way to get underneath the f ground floor of the building we were in and wait there till we were called to come and take a soldier who had been injured back down the hill. And a shell was fired and hit 
this house that we were all in and it was pretty loud and a lot of damage happened and a couple of guys upstairs got injured but uh, it, it, no, I don't think anything came back down as low as we were so none of it, none of the four of us were hurt Tell me the difference between what a stretcher bearer does and what a full-on combat medic does. Well, the stretcher bearer has to stay near the head of the company because there are people who are injured from every platoon, every squad, and they don't always have the, the same place. So the, the word for a medic would come to the platoon, the medic would go and begin to help the injured. And during that time, they would call on us to approach them and pick them up and take them back down to the aid station, which was usually way down a rather steep mountain. So tell me usually the distance between where you're picking up the wounded soldiers and the aid station. Usually how far are you traveling? Well, it wouldn't. I wouldn't think it was as long as we did sometimes uh, when we were in... Uh, the flat country. It seemed farther and certainly longer in time to be able to come down from a rather steep mountain because there were no roads there and lots of times no paths. Occasionally we would be going back down where mules were brought up during the night every night to bring them food, ammunition and things of that nature and they created a little bit of a path with, which helped us go down. And eventually, can you take me through, I mean, once you get the wounded soldiers back to the aid station, as a stretcher bearer, you go back to the front? Exactly. Immediately. How many men to a stretcher? Uh, we, were, we only carried one injured man. It took four of us to do that. Is it ever possible for two men to carry a stretcher? Well, occasionally, but... Only if it was a pretty small guy and, a, and flatter ground than some of this uh, sh stuff coming down the mountains. That was pretty difficult. And so, by the time you had uh, joined the 36th Infantry Division, the fighting in Salerno was over. What about San Pietro? Ah, uh, yes. San Pietro was... The battle there occurred in one of the other regiments of my of my but uh, group, and so we didn't get into much of that. We've had similar types of things, but not that particular one. Yeah, when we came back down from the uh, casino area, uh, and we're getting ready to go up to Anzio, that's when that uh, Vesuvius had a little uh, halfway explosion. Yep, L-L-O-N-G-O, yeah. Um, before we move on, can you talk to me, do you remember anything about the Rapido River? Yes, uh, Rapido is the way we pronounce Rapido. it. Rapido. Yes, yes, we, fortunately, the 142nd Regiment was not the top one to get initially into the attempt to cross that river. But the people who did make it across were really shot to pieces. And we had a few casualties in ours, but we didn't have nearly as many men who actually got into the river and tried to get across to the other side. And of course, General Mark Clark made us try to cross that river three different times. And all three, it just the Germans just took us to, to the store, boy, I'll tell you. They really were heavily able to uh, have proper machine gun positions that we couldn't fire on or even see or anything. What are your thoughts of Mark Clark? What do I think about him? Well, we were terribly disappointed about that thing. I know he did some wonderful things before we ever got into Italy over in North Africa. But uh, he was a hard guy, and uh, he, didn't, he didn't make t too few bad choices, we think. So could you tell me about when you became a full-on medic, 
Can you talk to me about your memories of the first men who you patched up? Yes. And I didn't patch the poor guy up because he died immediately. We, this was at, we had gone to Anzio at that time. And we were heading into the hills uh, to, to Valletri because our division, its purpose in going to Anzio, which had already been captured by other divisions, we were to break through the German lines and to travel as rapidly as we could up and grab Rome. And we were able to do that. But we started out one morning. It was a nice sunny day. We were going up the hill, as I said, toward this village of, of Valletra. And we were told to stop about 10, 10 a.m. in the morning. And so we were lying there on the ground waiting to be told to get up and go again. And uh, I was under one of the very few trees in that particular area with our uh, top sergeant in, in our platoon. And my uh, buddy, Leo Torrey, was up the hill under a pile of big rocks. And he hollered at me, hey, Doc, I've got a very good, safe-looking place up here. Why don't you come up with me? And I said, uh, Lee, I've got a nice, one of the most shady places in the whole area here. I'm going to stay here. It'll be okay. And he called me again, and he called me a third time. And finally I said, all right, shut up. I'll come up. And I got up, and I walked up the hill all the way and got down behind the stones that he had. And I no longer had sat down. Then we all heard a cannon firing. And we could hear the shell coming, whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. And I don't know for certain whether it was a, the shell itself was an actual explosive air in, in the air or whether it hit the tree, but it exploded in the tree that I was lying under with, with the sergeant. And it killed him instantly. It just tore up the ground. And I jumped up immediately and started running back down. And, and Tori said, Doc, stay here. I said, I know Bob's been hit. I have to go. <laughs> and I got down there, and he had just been shattered like the ground had. He, he was hit in the head many times and all over his body. And thank heaven, he didn't have much pain, I'm sure. This was your sergeant. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about who he was, what kind of person he was? He was a terrific guy. And he had been, of course, in charge of our company, uh, our platoon, when they made the invasion uh, in Salerno. And he earned a distinguished service cross for his work there. His name was... Uh, Healer, Bob Healer, Robert Healer was his name. And he was a wonderful guy. And in later years after the war, I saw his sister, his sister had written a letter that I somehow was able to observe. Uh, I can't remember exactly what it was printed in. And I wrote to her and identified myself and said that I had been with her brother when he died. And if she'd like to know what the situation was, I'd be very happy to write her and tell her. And she responded, and I did write her and tell her what the story was. And I wanted to emphasize the fact that Bob had been killed instantly. But, How old would you say he was when he was killed? Well, I would say that he was probably 24 at least. I, I, I'm not certain at all, but I, I think it was at least that. Can you tell me a little more about his characteristics, his personality? Well, all I can say, is, and the best thing I can say, is he was always a wonderful soldier. He was always very kind to us, trying to keep us all out of trouble, taking risks himself in order to help us. Tremendous guy. 
it was only probably two hours before uh, Bob had been hit that uh, Wilfred Paul uh, was standing up talking to, he was a sergeant for one of the squads, squad leader, and he was standing up there, and, and several of us were right, right near him too, and a single shot came, it was, it was a rifle shot, and struck him right in the throat and cut his, uh, what's that name of that th uh, th uh, big uh, the larynx? blood veil? Uh, it, it's a great vein there that, that was broken, and uh, it just killed him instantly, caused him to die instantly. There was nothing I could do about it. Uh, I couldn't stop it, and even if I had stopped it, he had lost enough blood that we were never given any that I could use to fill him back up again. That's the darndest thing I ever experienced. Why we never had blood plasma over there in that war, I cannot understand. Gosh. His name was Wilfred Paul, P-A-U-L. And what kind of person was he? He was a nice guy. He wasn't quite as much a, like a soldier as, as Bob Heeler was, but he was, he was a very good uh, squad leader. Nice guy. When, when Wilfred got hit with that rifle a bullet, it hit him right here in the juggler vein and blood flowed like a hose going off. And it, he, he just died right there because we couldn't stop the blood coming and we had none to replace. Well, he couldn't talk to me, but I can see what was happening because he was just spraying out of his neck. Yeah, and so I just, I had, I grabbed a bunch of wads of cloth, met a medical paper or a stuff and put it up against it try to hold it down but you know you couldn't you couldn't put a, a ring around his neck to stop it it would have would have flowed inside anyway I'm quite sure by the, but when you got to him he was still alive he was still alive yes how long was he alive for I can't think it was more than seven or eight minutes and he wasn't able to communicate at all I mean was no. he no, he could. His his throat was full of blood all the time, of course. And I think it probably probably hit his uh, speech functions in there too. So, this is in, in the same day. Two of the men yeah. were killed. Yeah, but there have been days when more than two were killed. <laughs> but these were two platoon sergeants. And, Well, shortly after that, we were we took off again and started heading to, up over the hill and toward Rome. And uh, we, I don't remember exactly how many days it took us, but it wasn't much more than a week. And we were the first troops into Rome. That, that, and Rome had been declared by both sides uh, that, that it would not be uh, protected by the Germans or attacked by us. So fortunately, Rome did not get torn up. Did you have any experiences with the Pope or the Vatican? I did with the Vatican. Um, I, I can't remember how many days our outfit stayed out of combat while the Germans were retreating in Rome, but I, I didn't have anything that I had to do because people weren't getting injured, of course. So one of my friends in the platoon and I decided we'd go look around the city, and I suggested to him that we go to the Vatican because I had seen it, pictures of it, and it looked pretty interesting. And um, he was a rifleman, and he carried his rifle with him. And we walked all the way from where we were headquartered to the Vatican and up the steps and into the church. And nobody was there. Not a single soul. We walked around all on the first floor and looked at everything, even touched some things that we probably wouldn't have done if anybody had been here. But still, after an hour of doing that, nobody showed up. And we've happened to find a door on the first floor that led to a stairway that would take us up to the second level where we could still look down at the floor we had been at. So we walked up there. We walked all around the thing looking at the other different things and while we walked around 
we found another door that led us out into the underneath side of the dome. And it was a circular stairway that tilted and swung around that dome until you could get up all the way to the top. And it was the strangest thing. It, 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 you couldn't walk it, you had to kind of crawl it, but it got us out on the roof there. And then we were standing below that huge circular uh, scenery thing up on top of it. And it was all metal and it, it looks like it's about three inches in diameter from the ground, but it's actually about 10 feet wide. And my buddy and I both got up inside and all the way around its periphery, there were slots in there about two inches wide. And we could look around and see all the seven hills of Rome and everything else. And it was just astonishing. And after a while there, we decided we better get out. So we went back down and walked out, still hadn't seen a single soul. And I've often wondered whether there were people watching us looking from some hiding place and the reason they didn't come out and say something to us was because my friend was carrying a rifle and they might have not experienced any uh, communications with Americans at that time. They might have thought we were as nasty as the Germans. Could you please tell me, sir, the incident that led you ultimately receiving the Bronze Star for Valor? Uh, well, it was for, it was for my going down and looking at uh, Bob Wheeler, but then, according to that... Uh, Citation? Uh, yes. It shows that, that we, got, we got a full artillery barrage at that time, and, and a, seven or eight other people were injured, and I had to run around during all that art, artery, artillery coming in and get them patched up and and uh, get ready to go be taken back down to the to the uh, medical department do you remember that yes i remember that you know it's uh, kind of interesting Re reminded me of a scene that was one of the scenes in that band of brothers thing where the the medic of in the platoon that they were photographing was running around while everybody else was on the ground or in, in a hole in the ground. And we were running around standing up <laughs> in much more danger. But that's, that's the way it works. You have to do it. Do you remember the first time you came across German casualties? Well, the first casualties that were German that I came across were dead. Um, and frankly, I can't remember ever seeing a German s a soldier that I had had to pick up until after I was taken prisoner by the Germans. And that's when I did patch up some of their uh, people. But the, the first dead Germans that you saw, I mean, were these in the hills in Italy or the mountains in Italy? Yes, they, they were, yes. And, uh, more up in, uh, in uh, Anzio, and then later when we got into France itself, there were more there. And can you tell me about the first time you saw American casualties? Well, that was uh, when we were still in the hills over Casino before we ever went up to Anzio. A couple of, a couple of guys got hurt. And uh, at that time, I was really uh, in the uh, litter bearer squad uh, most of the time. And uh, I, I can't say we ever carried a German down, but I can remember seeing some that somebody had been taking care of. But as you were, when you were a litter bearer, were you only transporting the wounded to the first aid station or also the dead Americans? Only, only the wounded, because there was no point of taking. There, there was a, a, a group of, of American soldiers uh, who did follow us after everybody had left that particular area alone from fighting. And these guys weren't going to get hurt themselves, and they would go and, and find every dead body, whether German or American, and, and try to get their dog tags and identify them so they, 
they could uh, report that. As you have witnessed, it hurt me pretty badly to see my guys die. Um, and I was, I always thought wars were horrible things. And I didn't, one of, the, one of the things I was pleased about being made a medic instead of a rifleman, I think that I was able to be a little more rugged and perhaps a little, you might say, a little braver to try to help my guys than I would be risking the same life to try to kill Germans. Can you tell me, though, uh, after Anzio, what happens to you? You end up going to Rome, and then after Rome, what happens? Well, we, we went uh, probably another 50 miles north of Rome, and then went back and boats picked us up and carried us back down to the area of Salerno. And our next job was to invade southern France. Uh, and, and we finally did, after being down there about around Salerno, about uh, two weeks, uh, taking landing practice again, getting in these uh, floatable trucks, uh, tanks that we had. And uh, then we got in, uh, in ships and were taken up into the southern France area along the uh, Mediterranean. And we all went ashore there. And this was on the 15th of August, 1944. And we all went, we all left the boats climbing down those uh, rope ladders and into the LSVPs, uh, landing craft uh, uh, vehicles or personnel. And we went out in, towards the shore and we circled around and around and around for a while. And finally, we went off in a different direction. And I didn't find out until much later that the place we were initially supposed to land was the hottest place there. It was so heavily uh, protected by the Germans that uh, they just decided we would move to a, an easier place to land. And it's probably a very good thing that we did. So as soon as we got on land, we began immediately to move farther north, and uh, we kept going for the, probably the next two months of uh, going north until we got up uh, at least in the same uh, elevation as Paris was in. Now, the operation in southern France, Operation Dragoon, it was also known as the Champagne Campaign. I'm not sure what that meant. Well, because that's where a lot of the vineyards are in France, oh, in southern yeah. France. Oh, yeah, sure. And the fighting was pretty tame in that part of the region for a little while. Well, in our case, uh, it was only because the Germans were, were getting away from us rather quickly. There were times when we would know that they were gone, and they'd sent trucks for us, and we may go, go north 50 miles in a day. Other times we'd run into a blockade of Germans and we'd have to get off the trucks and fight them. And a couple of times we, we were in a very bad situation when we got up along with the Vos, Vosges Mountains. Talk to me about your experiences in the Vosges Mountains. <clears throat> Can right. you describe what it looks like? Well, this was uh, the Vosges Mountains were between France and Switzerland in our area. And we, we didn't intend to get into Switzerland at all, but we were right up next against it. But one of, our, one of the battalions in the 141st Infantry uh, was uh, captured or surrounded, rather, by the Germans, and they couldn't break out in less than three weeks. And they lost an awful lot of men there. And they were assisted by two of the most highly decorated U.S. troops in the, in the whole war, uh, both in the Pacific and in, the, in uh, the European. And would you believe it? They were Jer Japans. They were Japanese soldiers. It was the 442nd Regiment or the 101st Battalion. 
And as I said a moment ago, they were the most highly decorated American troops in the war. Terrific guys. When you were in the Vosges Mountains, do you remember any of the tree bursts? When the German artillery would hit the trees? Well, that, that incident that happened and, and killed Bob Wheeler there at Anzio, that was one of them. But I don't remember it too much uh, more than that up, up north in France. We did have plenty of artillery, but I think most of it landed and, and didn't uh, explode until they hit the ground. Unless you were in a forest and then they would, would hit the trees. But they were not uh, the type of shell that even if there weren't a tree, they would explode in the air, I think. Before we go any further and in your personal journey, I just want to go over some general questions about being a combat medic, okay. if that's okay. Um, as a combat medic, what kind of wounds are you expected to treat on the, in the field versus the kind of stuff that you just send back to the first aid station? Well, actually, you're expected to do something with every wounded person. And, of course, it's obvious that there were some wounds that were much more uh, deadly than, than others. And the ones that were maybe shot in, in the leg or sh shot in the arm or something, but never in the, in the chest, hardly. Uh, all we could do with a chest bullet hole would be to try to put enough uh, cloth and, pla and uh, pa paste uh, tape there to, so the guy could hold his own uh, chest and try to keep the blood from spurting. But um, we, we would be able to, have to uh, apply bandages to our, uh, arm and leg and other places uh, where they were wounded. So you had a first aid kit? Oh yes, a very large one. Yeah, we, we, we carried a bandage uh, pay, uh, cloth and lots of uh, tape and I had a bandage scissor that I could cut a guy's clothes open with. And we also had uh, morphine, yes. Uh, we, we had probably carried a dozen or so mor morphine uh, shots with guys. And, uh, and what about that powder? Sulfur? Yeah. Oh, yes. We had that sulfonilamide powder. That, that's what we would spray on the wound itself before we put the bandage on. And what would that powder do? Well, it was supposed to keep the uh, worms, not worms, but germs away from them, and, and they wouldn't break out like that. And I, th I think it did pretty well. Uh, lots of times they weren't hit in the chest, no, uh, in the middle of the chest, but a bullet would have been right going through their ribs or something like that. And we could deal with that. But for the men who were hit in the chest or the stomach, I mean, what would the protocol be? How would you try to patch them up? Well, you had to have something go all the way around the entire body because the purpose of a bandage is to stop the blood flow as much as you can. And you have to make sure that it's tight. And you have to make sure if the, if the wounded guy is able, if he... he can put his hand on the bandage and press it in himself or have one of the guys, uh, the litter bearers, do it for him on the way down. That's, that's have happened too. But, that the litter bearers would hold it down for him? Yes. Um, when you were in combat, did you come across any men who had lost limbs from shrapnel or bullets? Yes, I did. I'll tell you about that and when we get a little further. Um, is that about Ben? Yes. Okay. Um, before we get to that, though, most of the wounds that you came across, was it uh, due to shrapnel or small arms fire? <clears throat> Frankly, I, ca I can't really say very accurately what I think it is. There was an awful lot of sh shrapnel, um, but there were plenty of bullets, too. And uh, 
I, I don't know which of those caused the most deaths. Um, like when Bob Heeler was hit in Anzio, of course, they were, they were relatively small shell fragments, apparently. But um, I've seen others when the one that hit me in the back of the leg here, I, I'm sure was probably about that big, but it wasn't very thick. The first time uh, I, was, I was hit in the hand, uh, and it, I, it was shell fire, uh, shell fragments. I, I think we were just walking through the woods, and, and the Germans knew we were coming, and they sent some uh, shells over to us, and it, it happened to hit me while I was walking, I believe. And um, it bled like the heaven, and, and I still have a, a, one piece of, of shell fragment in here. So I... Uh, yeah, it, it doesn't show very much, but it's in here. No. I, I, I hurt my hand a couple of years ago, and I went to, to have the doctor look and see if I had a broken bone. And he came back to me with the x-rays, and he said, no, you got no broken bone, but what is this thing here? And I looked at it, and I thought, Gee, oh, my God, that's a shell fragment that they didn't take out during the war. And so that was the first time you were wounded? Yeah. Separate from that, yeah. But How were you wounded the next time? I was just walking, and it it hit me, a shell fragment. It wasn't it wasn't a, a handheld weapon. The shell, both of them were shell fragments. And was this in France or Italy? That was in France, and I've got a scar about that long, there. And so, how long were you off the front after you were wounded? Uh, that time, I think it was not more than probably about 10 days. Uh, it, didn't, it didn't hit the bone or any other parts except just uh, flesh. So I, I was able to start walking again pretty soon. So uh, as a medic, what did you have to identify yourself as a medic? Well, the only person, people that I had to identify to really were our enemies, the Germans. And that was supposed to be done uh, in two ways. First, our steel helmets would have a, a red cross and on a white circular background on both the front and the back. And then we would have around our upper arms uh, a band that showed the red cross there too. I, I hardly ever wore that, but I did wear the uh, one on my helmet, but not always. Why not always? Well, this is something that I did, and I, it was foolish probably, but I got tired a couple of times when we were in France of being shot when I knew that the rifleman could see the helmet, the red cross on my helmet. And if they're going to shoot me knowing that they shouldn't, then I'm going to throw that helmet away and, and pick up a, a rifle or, or some weapon. And I did that twice. But I never had, I don't know, an opportunity to use it, but I never had time to use it because I was always patching up people who had been wounded. And I, I couldn't lie down and try to see a guy I could shoot at. So I'd, after having worn it for two or three weeks, I'd throw it away and get my other helmet again. And as I say, I did that twice. And one of those two times, I picked up something that no other of our soldiers had seen. It was the very first uh, weapon, what do they call them? Uh, you know, the weapons we're trying to keep people from selling here in this country now for murders, automatic weapon. What was it, like a burp gun or something? Well, oh, it was it was an automatic weapon, but it was the first one that they would cause calling us some kind of a weapon. And um, the German, Germans were the first ones to, to decide to make one of those things, and they did. But I never fired that either, so it probably was a stupid thing to do. Now, the Germans, uh, they would use your cross as a target? Oh, I don't know. I don't think that. They probably were, if I was standing up, which I mostly was, 
they would try to shoot you in the chest. It's a much bigger target. So it, but I'm saying, like, they disregarded it. They disregarded it. That's the thing. They, they, they were close enough, I know, to recognize what that was. And I remember one time when they didn't, and this was really interesting. There was one day when somebody from a, another platoon came to me and said, Doc, you have to come. Our, our medic is gone. And we've got a, one of our lieutenants is lying out here on this plaza, uh, shot full of bullets. You've got to come and help him. So I came, and I happened to have my Red Cross on. And th this guy was out in a, in a paved open area in this little town that had, it was a brick all down all over there. And he was lying right in the place where he was first shot. And I know darn well that the machine gunner could see me coming up toward him. And I thought, well, let's hope he's one of these guys who knows what the laws are. And he didn't shoot at me. Maybe he had been picked, had picked up and gone, but I doubt it. I think he was still there. So I, I had to take care of this lieutenant. So what's it like when you're attending to a wounded soldier, knowing full well that the enemy, the Germans, have you in their sight and that they could kill you if they wanted to? What is that like? Yet you still have to attend to the wounded soldier. You do. Well, this guy was in horrible pain. The poor guy was rolling around, and I, I had to lie down on top of him to keep him from trying to get up. And his, he had been hit in his stomach, and there was blood down in his, in the, his pants leg that you wouldn't believe. And I cut them off and tried to get to the wound, but it was so bad. I don't know how long he had lain there before they got me there, but it was quite a little while. And... He just couldn't make it. He did. He passed away. When you were with him? Yeah. I told I told the guys who were hiding out of the range of the of his enemy that to call call a litter bearer squad to take him. And I don't know whether they got there before he died or not, but I know he died anyway. Was he able to communicate with you at all? No. He was moaning. Oh. My God, it was terrible. Terrible. So, these are just a couple of general questions. Um, did you have any experiences against German landmines in Italy or Ger in Italy or France? Well, if you mean, did I have to take care of anybody who was wounded by one of those? No, I don't think I ever did. But were you guys ever caught in a minefield? Well, we, we passed through them a number of times, there's no question about it. Sometimes other people would have been through there and they would have marked a safe path, but most of the time it was just like it was over in North Africa that I've seen about, that you just had to be very careful. Um, I, I know there was one incident where a guy in, in my company, I don't remember whether I was there and saw him, but I know I didn't have to come and, and take care of him. He stepped on one of these uh, uh, mines that uh, uh, explode up into the air about three feet and then, then go off. Bouncing Betty? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, But I, I wasn't involved in that personally. Um, did you have any experiences uh, going on patrols Yes, I did. I, I was expected to go on any patrol, <clears throat> pardon me, that was likely to have wounded soldiers if they were going in to try to capture a couple of Germans or something. Just say that one more time. <clears throat> if it was a com... Do you want some water? Just let me... <clears throat> I get you some If it was a combat patrol, meaning that the soldiers were going out there to fight something or to try to kept capture a couple of enemies, I would have to go with them because that was the most likely place that w somebody was going to be wounded. And tell me about your experiences on some of these patrols. Well, I didn't go on many because for some reason we didn't have many combat patrols. We would have patrols go out to try to see find out where the Germans were, but they didn't go out 
in deliberation to, to try to fire at somebody like that. So the only one I went out on there was that we didn't contact the, the Germans at all. We never knew where they were before we started, of course. Were you ever strafed by the German Luftwaffe? Well, I've, I've seen German planes fly over us a couple of times, but they never did try to shoot us. We saw the first jet plane that a any of the armies in the world had had. The, the Germans flew over during the, the, the uh, winter of 1944-45. And the, the one I saw, I, I don't think he was more than 250 feet off the ground, scooting along so he didn't want to get far enough up that somebody could see him with, with a gun that would take him down. And so, did you also have experiences against uh, German snipers in combat? I, I can't remember doing that, no. We had snipers fire at us occasionally, but uh, I never had a, a person shot by them that I had to go and take care of. But were there times that you guys were like in a town or in a wooded area that you were under sniper fire? Well, you didn't know whether it was sniper or just more, more troops doing it. Not everybody was firing at the same time. Um, do you remember fighting in any of the towns in Italy? Oh, yes, I do. Talk to me about what, it, what it's like when it comes to house-to-house -to -house fighting is what it is. Yes, well, <clears throat> up till that time, we were mostly in the woods in southern France. But this one time is... is probably the worst situation I, I ever experienced during the war. We, we were going to be uh, sent to take a, a small town called Oberhofen. And at, that, at the time, before we started out, we were in an, a very, the next town called Bishwater. And there was quite a wide field which was filled with snow between those two at that time I would say was probably at least a half a mile across and there was a small river which flowed through that open space and twisted and turned and uh, was a little closer to the Oberhofen side than it was Bishwater. So we took off one morning and we had to go around the river uh, because we had uh, no bridge across it and the, true, the engineers had built a bridge so we could have a few tanks come in on one side and we went across that bridge and into Oberhofen and uh, we encountered a, f a small bit of Germans who tried to stop us from coming in but uh, we, we were more the heavier uh, fixed up than they were and we kicked them all out and took the town. And we occupied every place that we had enough troops to take a place in a different house in. And we'd been there for a while and the Germans counterattacked, which was something that the Germans did every single time you kicked them back from where they had been set up. They would have make a counterattack. And they started coming back from the far end of town. And um, some of them went into houses and, and knocked our guys out or took them prisoner or something. And a couple of our guys in the neighborhood I was in uh, were wounded, and I had to run across the street on the other side to t take care of them. And that wouldn't have been much problem, except the Germans had set up a machine gun on the far end of, of the street street and every time anybody would show themselves there uh, on the on the street they would fire at them and uh, I, I went across I think three times back and forth and I would run get back from the door of my house and start running and leap it out onto the street and run as fast as I could across and dive into the house across the street and then I had to come back in the same fashion. So I never got hit. But the final time, I didn't, I didn't go more than three times, I think. And when we were back in the original house, somebody hollered, here comes a tank. 
and all of us kind of thought it probably was ours, but we looked up the street where this machine gun was sitting, and it was a German tank, and they were coming down the street, and for some reason, maybe because they had seen me running out of, the, out of my house, they came right beside the house that we were in, and we were looking through the glass window at him, and he rolled his turret around and his gun pointed right at the window we were looking through and he fired and he didn't hit the glass but he hit the bricks that were around the glass and it just threw bricks all into the living room where we were standing and strangely enough I think only one of us got hurt at least badly and that was a, a, a friend of mine in, in my platoon of course and it hit him in the leg and came very near taking his leg off. It was only, it was only holding by a small uh, article of some kind. I don't know what it was. So I grabbed him because I was standing very close to him and a couple of other guys helped me get him over to on the floor where there was a door to lift up and you could go down into the uh, basement down below there. And I got him down there and set him up on a, a place where I could see what his leg was like. And the other guys were upstairs trying to beat the Germans away. And um, I had to cut the guy's leg off because I knew it, it, it didn't have more than a finger's f f f f f uh, size of blood, uh, I mean, of no, meat still holding. And I had to cut it off, and I had tied a uh, a rope around his knee, uh, knee above that to keep the blood from flowing. And, um, and I had given him a morphine, and he was moaning and groaning and just moving around a little bit. And uh, I I tried to put a bandage around his leg, uh, which I, which I did put around, but it, it wasn't bleeding much because I had a tourniquet there. And uh, he, he, his face had turned as white as you can imagine. He'd lost so much blood from it. And I knew he was in terrible shape. And I, I was sitting there trying to figure out what, what more I could do, if any, to help him. And the, the, my platoon sergeant opened up the door above and said, Doc, we've been ordered to leave the leave the." village, come on, let's go. And I said, Charlie, I can't leave Ben. I, I don't think he's going to make it, but I can't leave him. So he said, okay, well, if he does die, come on. And they all took off and left, and Ben and I were down there. And he was still moving a little bit, but he wasn't even moaning anymore, and he kept getting lighter and lighter. And I gave him a second shot, hoping that it would, it would take whatever pain he had away. And all of a sudden, I heard boots walking across on the, step, uh, on the floor above, and I could hear German language being spoken. And I thought, oh, brother, I hope they don't open that door and look down at us. And they didn't. And they didn't stay very long. They walked away. And after a while, it had been silent long enough, and I thought I'd take a look up and see what if everything was okay. So I opened the door a little bit. Nobody there. And I went back down and looked at Ben, and I felt his pulse, and I felt his throat, and he wasn't breathing or no evidence that his heart was beating. He was dead. So I thought, well, I guess it's my time to get the heck out of here. So I went back up and jumped through the same window everybody else had jumped out in and started running down the hill toward the river. And I had probably run not more than a hundred yards when Germans saw me and started firing at me. So I was right next to the river practically then, so I dived in and went down into the frozen water. There was ice on top of the water, and I had to get down as far as I could because there wasn't much of a bank above the, wa the water that would protect me from their firing. So I was lying in that ice cold water now. It seemed like a year, but it couldn't have been more than 30 minutes or I probably never would have gotten out of there. 
But after things had quieted down, I started crawling up to continue my going to back to Bishwater. And I was stiff as a board as I got up on the land there. And I'm getting up and I looked about 10 feet away from me and here's a German soldier getting up too. And I couldn't figure out why he was there, but I think he must have been captured and taken as prisoner. And when the guys got, everybody got fired at, he just dropped on the ground and stayed there because he knew he could get back to his own people. Well, we both stood up and then we, we looked at each other and we looked at the ground but between us. We were only about eight to 10 feet apart. And there was a GI rifle there, the M1. And we looked at it and looked back at each other and then we both made a dive for it. And I was so stiff, I didn't have a chance to grab it. So he grabbed it and picked it up. And I just stood there looking at him and he pointed it at me and pulled the trigger and it didn't fire. And he looked at it and thump, beat it a little bit and tried it again. He tried to pull the trigger and it, and it didn't fire again. He tried it three times and it didn't fire at all. Now, during that time, we'd been standing up and his German buddies had seen us and they couldn't tell whether he was American or German from that position. And they started firing at us. And he threw the rifle down and ran his way. And I took off as fast as I could going the other way. And I finally got back to Bishwater in a few minutes. And as I was approaching it, I could see we had set up a machine gun on our side in case the Germans tried to come across. And I was hollering and waving at these guys who were running this, commanding this gun that I'm an American. So I finally got into the town okay. And then I had to try to find some dry clothes in it. And I don't remember how I got them, but I did. So that was a very wonderful day. But that's it. What kind of person was Ben? Well, he was a sergeant himself. He, he, he was one of the squad leaders. Now, I think he probably had taken over after uh, Wilfred Paul had been killed uh, back at Anzio. And um, he was a nice guy. You know, you hear, you hear stories about the feeling of, of troops to, of each other and how close they feel, and how much they will do for each other. And uh, you, you, you could never find out how much that is unless you are in it and experience it yourself. And all of us would, would risk our lives to try to help our buddies. You can't, you can't avoid that. Ben was a good guy. You get to be so close to every one of your comrades, and you would do anything for them. I'm sure most everybody has heard about a, a, a hand grenade being thrown into your midst, and one soldier would dive on it and be killed by it to try to save everybody else. That that's that's probably the worst of the whole situation. But we would all take risks to try to help our friends. Well, at a certain point, they were more than friends, though, right? You're darn right. Were they like brothers? Yes, they were. Band of brothers, there we have it. Let me say, I think our the people that I were with and, and I myself were brothers as much as those guys in the 101st Airborne were. Um, what was going on in your head when that German prisoner was firing the rifle? I mean, were you... Were you just standing there? I, I, nothing was going through my head, I think. I was just standing there. And I think maybe, and I've thought over the years, maybe part of it was because if, if I had picked up the rifle, I wouldn't have tried to shoot him, and maybe he won't try to shoot me either. That didn't work. I, the, 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 the way when you first started the story, I thought it was going to go more like he picked up the rifle and then he told you to get, get lost. No, he didn't. But he tried to kill you. Yes, he did. Three times. And yeah. I've, I've often wondered why that rifle didn't fire. And, and a couple of the things that I 
think could happen? Well, first of all, it wouldn't have any, any if it didn't have any ammunition in it. But I, I know that wasn't the problem because I could see the, the rifle, and that's the rifle I was trained with. And the, the thing always stays open for you to put new, new ammunition in uh, if, when it's empty. And it was closed, so that wasn't the problem. And the, the other thing I thought was, well, maybe the guy had left his um, safety on, and this German soldier didn't know how to release the safety. So, or maybe there was something inside the rifle that had happened to it. The guy might have dropped it in the water going across, and it was frozen. But those three ideas are the only thing I can think of. Well, maybe the, the previous rifleman who had it, it was a jammed rifle, and maybe that's why he left it there. That may be, yep. It could be. Boy. Um, could you just talk uh, again about Ben? What, do you know his last name? Yes, it's uh, Ben Brown, B-R-A-W-N or something like that. <sighs> How old would you say he was when he was killed? Well, I think he probably was uh, four or five years older than I am. <clears throat> but he was a Texas guy, you know, and they always <laughs> they always look a little rougher than the, some of us city boys. And... and his leg, you you'd mentioned earlier, there was only a thin piece of skin keeping his leg attached? Yes. W it, well, it wasn't actually skin. It was a ligament, I think. It had a little flesh along with it, but I think it was mostly a ligament. It's amazing that it had held together for us to even get him down into the basement. Cellar, whatever you want to call it. And was he able to communicate at all? No, he never said a word. Never uttered one word. When you were uh, treating any of these men who you treated out in the field, did you ever interact with the chaplain? Because I know, wouldn't the chaplain come to give last rites to some of the soldiers? They never did with us because we were always way too far away from them, apparently. I don't, I don't think they left the uh, command center of the company at any time. Some of them would have, but I, I didn't experience that. The only thing I ever had done with a chaplain was when my father was notified that I was taken prisoner, he wanted to find out what had happened. And he wrote and to, to my outfit, and the letter was given to the chaplain who responded to it. My dad had the letter, and I read it myself. And the, the chaplain... Uh, indicated that he knew me uh, and that he thought probably I was captured, but he didn't know me at all. I'd never seen the guy before. But uh, I think he did, he did the right thing to, to tell a little fib, make my dad feel better anyway. Um, after this incident with Ben, you get back to the unit. What happens from there? When I got back to our own people, well, as I said, the very first thing was I tried to find some dry clothes. And I don't know why we had clothes that wasn't on somebody there, but I did find them. And uh, frankly, I can't remember whether we spent the night there, but I think we probably did in that same town. And then we took off the next day uh, and began moving farther north and closer to the Rhine. And talk to me about the crossing of the Rhine River. Well, <clears throat> what happened before the actual crossing is we were face to face with the uh, yeah the Siegfried all the way from the North Sea to the, to the Swiss border, and it was taken. It had all kinds of artillery pieces and, and devices to stop our tanks from coming in, pretty much like it was along the uh, British uh, coast uh, up, up, up uh, east, west of us. And so I can't imagine why this happened, but three days before we assaulted this line, I was released from F Company and sent over to G Company. I think they must have lost 
two medics and, and they wanted at least to have two uh, for the three platoons. And so they sent me over there. And I, I wasn't happy with that at all. But the, the very, I think it was only two days after my being moved over to G Company that we were told we were going to go in and address this uh, line. And uh, I met, I, had, I was there one night and I slept with this one guy who had had his buddy killed a couple of days before. And they were splitting us up into groups of six or seven and assigning each of these little groups to a particular target to capture on the, on the uh, line up there. And the one that I was uh, part of had a big, huge concrete uh, pillbox to take. And we started out in the morning and <clears throat> we succeeded in, in taking, capturing that pillbox. And we no longer w captured it and got inside than the Germans counterattacked as they always did. And everybody was kicked back down the hill except us. And we were in that pit of uh, pill box and because we weren't taking any fire from the Germans in there. So there we were and we looked at each other and said, how in the heck are we going to take care of this? So they, they, they saw some Germans coming in little uh, trenches that they had built. They were only about half their height deep. And they were running up and we were firing at them, but we ran out of ammunition after a while. <clears throat> and then there was only two things that we could do. We could surrender or those guys would come over and throw hand grenades through the firing ports and kill us. So we decided we'd, it'd be better to try to, to uh, stop firing. So they, they came up to the port, the uh, back port that we came through, and we didn't realize it, but there was a handle on the outside of this door, just like the one inside that we thought had locked it. So they opened it, and there was a German sergeant with a burp gun standing there pointing at us, come in the house. So we did. And almost immediately, everybody but me were taken back from the front and down the hill toward about the level of the Rhine River, which was directly behind us. <clears throat> and the Germans happened not to have had a medic of their own, and they kept me up in their position all day, passing up their wounded. I don't think there were more than four or five that got hit that day, but one of them was the captain of the company that was there, and he was hit by a rifle bullet, just a shot across the forehead. And I... Uh, I tried to get him to lift his head back so that that powder I had to put on it wouldn't get in his eyes, but he, he didn't understand what I was saying. So I had to try to hold it and put it there myself, but I, I passed up his head and did the other things. And uh, while I was doing all this, there was one young guy there, and <clears throat> he was sitting down sometimes, and he had what I think was one of those uh, Hitler used knives and he was pretending to to clean his fingernails with it. And he would point it at me every once in a while like he was going to stab me, you know. But I, I know darn well he was just joking and trying to scare the heck out of me. But after dark that night, they took me away and I went back down and met up with the same guys I had been captured with that night before. So in a couple of days, we were sent uh, across the river <clears throat> and we began walking east towards Munich, I think. And we did that for two months because only 10 days or so <clears throat> after we went across, our American troops on the west side captured the one bridge that hadn't been blown. And they got quite a number of, of our armed a rifleman over and a little bit of armor and they were chasing us the entire two months before the end of the war and we kept walking and walking and walking until the end <clears throat> and it was uh, the problem with the thing was it, uh, it wasn't so difficult to do walking we had been walking for years ourselves 
But the German army never gave us one single mouthful of food on, on that whole 60-day walk. And the only food we had, we had already eaten, so we would try to get a little food from house frows when we'd stop at their villages sometimes at night. Occasionally they would give us something and, well, I lost 20 pounds during those two months in walking. And the other guys who were heavier than me probably lost more than that. But it, <clears throat> it wasn't the worst thing. I'm, I'm going to have to check. So the objective was to march you all the way to Munich. That's what we thought we were we were going to do. It was a main city we were heading towards. <clears throat> and what kind of... Uh, were there German guards with you every so often or...? No, they were. They walked with us completely over the time. With the group of seven of us that were captured that first day, there were only two guards. But as we joined more and more troops, which we did continuously along the route, uh, they would put more guards with us. And I, we had, I think, by the end of our walk, probably 300 POWs in, in the group. And um, Where would you guys sleep? We'd sleep on the side of the road. There was, there was no other place to go. That's what, what it was. How cold would it get? Well, it, well this was in, uh, we, I was captured, I think it was February. And uh, so we, kept, we walked through the end of February and March and, and then just the beginning of May. I think May 8th was the end of the war. And uh, it, it was, we were always, it was sunny days. We didn't have a drop of rain the whole time that I recall. So, and, and we had been relatively well dressed for cold weather ourselves anyway. So we didn't suffer from that. The only thing that we did suffer from one time was we heard airplanes coming from behind us. And I turned around and looked back and I thought, oh boy, it's P-47s coming in. But that wasn't a wonderful thing to do. They began to come down, descend from their height and firing their machine guns into our a group of uh, POWs thinking we were German soldiers. Uh, that's what they did all the time. And I, they killed, I, I don't know, I, I'm just guessing how many troops, but they probably killed 30 or more at the front of the, of the line. And then they made a 180 degree and then 60 degree, 360 turn and came back and were going to fire at us again. And we had spread out around, across the road and everybody was standing, looking at them and waving our arms. And they finally realized what we were and they wobbled their wings and they flew away from us. Thank goodness. So uh, Germans never, German Air Force never came through there. Did you see the German guards physically abuse any of the prisoners? No, I did not. And I never heard anybody say that that had happened. And I think the reason was the Germans realized that they had lost the war. And they didn't want to be caught doing bad things to American soldiers when, when they were POWs. Because they, they knew they would be paid for it. So that was a lucky thing. What do you remember about the destruction done to the German towns and cities as you guys marched past them? The, the, the march through cities? What do you remember about the destruction done to the German towns and cities as you guys marched past them? Well, the only one for which I have any memory at all was a one called Heilbronn. And it's not terribly far from the... Uh, Rhine River itself, but we walked through it probably about a week later. And strangely, all of the torn up buildings had, had been cleaned away, taken off the roadways, but the walls were standing up and there wasn't a roof or a floor in any building that we could see. Uh, as we walked through the main town, main street there, we'd look to the, every side and there they were, just the walls up, no debris lying around. 
I guess the Germans were anticipating rebuilding it when they won the war, but they didn't. And uh, that's, that's the way, I, several of them were. This one was the largest city, and it was the cleanest one that had been taken care of like that that we saw. About the end of the two months of walking, we approached the, the uh, Danube River, and we went across the river, the river bridge there, and we stopped, and they split our group into three, three pieces, and each of those groups went to a farmhouse of its own, and we stayed there for three days. And during that time, uh, each of us got a package of food and things from the Red Cross. The first thing we'd had that we didn't get given by some German families on our route. And one night we were talking to, I met two guys from the 63rd Infantry Division. Kind of interesting that I was in the 36th and they were in the 63rd. So we got speaking about it and one of us, it might have been me, I said, you know, last winter, up in the Battle of the Bulge, when the Germans were realizing they were going to have to run and get out of there or they would get captured, they killed a bunch of American POWs they had so that they didn't have to worry with them. And I said, you know, it's not impossible that they might try that here with us. And I, I just don't feel like I want to sit here and let that happen. If I'm going to die, I'd like to die trying to get away. What do you guys think? And they said, well, we know that happened because we've heard about it too. And he said, they said, how do you think we should make a, an escape out of here? I said, I don't know. But um, we were told that we were going to leave the day after tomorrow. And I said, now we've got some food that will help us live a while if we were wandering around in the country by ourselves, let's, uh, let's just, why don't we get up into the barn there and, and hide in the straws and see if they will walk off. And that's exactly what we did that next night when we thought we were going in this morning. After everybody was asleep, we sneaked up in, 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 in the dark and went into that barn, climbed up into the top, and went to the out, one of the outside walls and dug down into the snow as, of the uh, uh, sheep as far as we could. And uh, the next morning, the people all woke up and we could hear them hollering and hollering our, our names. And they sent three soldiers, I could, I could tell there were three, up into the barn where, where all the straw was with bayonets on a rifle and punching in the straw and trying to see if we were up there. But they, they didn't, they were in such a hurry to leave, they didn't do a whole lot of prodding around and never came near the outside doors on the outside wall. So the, that was very fortunate. And um, so they left and we stayed there in the, in the straw all day long until dark and then got out and started heading back toward the bridge we had come across three days before. But unfortunately, as we should have known, the bridge was guarded by Germans and we couldn't walk across it. So, so we went uh, away from the bridge along the river and into the woods and tried to figure out how we were going to get across. And fortunately we found a metal woodcutter's shack there, and it had some logs there, short logs, and also had some wire. So we decided we'd make a, a little raft and put it down in the water and go across that night. So we did that, and we took most of our clothes off and put it on this raft, carried it down to the river, got in the water, and started to cross. And we knew the moment we got in the water, that we weren't going to make it because the current was so swift coming from melted snow in the Vosges Mountains west of us and the temperature of it was so cold and the river was so wide that we were never going to make it across before we were driven right under the bridge and the German soldiers would see us certainly. 
So we just went, we had to go back and, and uh, get up on the land again. And uh, the next night we were there, a firefight broke out across the river. We could see bullets uh, fly, flying back and forth and hear all the machine guns going. And we knew it was our guys. But we also knew that every time our people tried to cross the river, they always fired artillery across to the other side to try to get rid of the soldiers who would be opposing them on that side. And we better get away from where they're going to shoot it. So we left the, the uh, woods the next morning before dawn and walked a couple of miles into the country again. Uh, in about 10 o'clock in the morning, I think it was, on a bright sunny day, we were on the side of this dirt road away from the river walking away from it a little more, and we heard the sound of a tracked vehicle, and we thought, oh my God, here comes a German tank. And we turned around and looked, and thank heaven, it was an American uh, uh, half-track. And there was a guy sitting up on top of it arm, uh, using a, four, a 50 caliber machine gun. And we realized that he wouldn't be able to identify us from that distance. So we lay down by the side of the road and waited till they were right beside us. And we jumped up and let them know we were Americans. And they stopped and they picked us up. They were on a reconnaissance trip, not fighting, but to see if they could see where the Germans had gone. And they carried us with them. And then when they finished that, they went back across the river and turned the three of us over to their company's headquarters, and that was the end of the war for the three of us. What was that like after being a prisoner for over two months to be back in Allied hands? Well, <clears throat> we didn't know how we were we were going to get from where we were to back back to the English Channel because you know it had taken us two months to walk where we were, but somehow and and my it escapes me I can't remember what we must have picked up at least some truck movements or something, and uh, been able to avoid walking the whole way because we got back there uh, probably in not more than a couple of weeks. And we found that during that time, our army had built at least five uh, buildings that were named after cigarettes, like Lucky Strike and Camel and others, which were just precisely for ex-POWs and let them sleep there. And they had foods being served 24 hours a day because of all the uh, skinny people that we had there. And uh, that's where we stayed until we found a ship going back across the Atlantic. And then we all three got on and went home. So it was quite an experience. Where did you arrive back in the U.S.? New York, New York City. Did you see yeah. the Statue of Liberty? As oh, you... we saw the Statue of Liberty. <laughs> Looks so beautiful. It was really great. It's a funny thing. On the same ship that, that I was on with my two buddies, there was a guy I had been in high school with, and he had been in the, in the Air Corps, and he, he was a two-engine, I think it was a B-25 bomber, bomber that he was flying, and it got shot down, and he was a POW, so... We had a lot of things to tell each other on that trip back. Tell me about your readjustment into civilian life. Did you have difficulties readjusting? Well, I, I, I think I did, but I, I don't believe I realized it so much at that time. But um, I didn't have many of my own friends coming back at that time, so I couldn't see people I had known before, and we could discuss what had happened to each of us or anything like that. So I just uh, lived with my parents, of course, and went around and would borrow one of their cars and drive somewhere when I, pardon me, when I wanted to go, and uh, went to see a few of the people who, of my friends who had not gone into the military at all. 
But um, my dad decided that he didn't think I was mentally in a very good situation. And he said, or asked me actually, would I like to go on a trip out west to go through some of the national parks? And I said, yes, I certainly would. So my whole family went on a trip out there. We went, the whole trip took 10,000 miles of driving. We went out into Rocky Mountain National Park and other parks out there. And then we came back here into Chicago and got on a boat that went through the Great Lakes and dumped us off into uh, Canada. <clears throat> and we uh, drove back then to New Brunswick where I had been born and saw a couple of our relatives and then headed south along US-1 all the way to Miami. 10,000 miles, that was very good. And uh, I enjoyed it very much. Whether it got me cleared up mentally or not, I'm not sure. How old were you when you came back home? 20. So you had gone overseas, fought in World War II, and you came back home when you were 20. Yeah. And that's like many guys did. In fact, there were people who were in the service at only 17. I think most of the 17ers were in the, in the Navy, though. Yeah, because the Navy let you join at 17, yeah. the Navy and the Marine Corps. Right. Um, did you have nightmares after the war? No, I never had a nightmare. D did loud noises bother you? No. Because, you know, back then cars would backfire a lot. Yes, And I it know. sounds like a gunshot. It never bothered me. But you want to hear something very strange that has nothing to do with me. My first wife married a friend of mine who was a, a soldier uh, in the 95th Infantry Division over in, in Europe. And he went through some pretty nice fights too, through forests and so forth. And she, she and he both told me he would get up darn near every light, night of his life and wander around in the house screaming, Hit the deck! Here's incoming! And he'd smash his, his fist into walls. And he, there would never was a night that he didn't do something like that. And um, I don't know why <clears throat> he would do it. it. It affected him that way than me because I know I saw three times or more as much combat as he did. But each one does his own, you know. What life advice do you want to give to future generations? Well, you cannot avoid getting into a war sometimes. And you can't avoid being taken into it yourself. And it's an honor to do it. We have to do it. But let's keep try to keep our government able to... to discuss things with, with foreign governments where we can always do something other than shoot at each other. War is the very last thing we should do. Any problem can be solved without being shot at. And that's what you should concentrate on. If you were to give me some advice for my life, what would you tell me? I'm the same age you were when you were in combat. Well, I don't know if I can give you advice or not because I don't know what is likely to happen. But if we have another war, World War II is going to look like a playground. And it's going to be mostly nuclear. And it may well destroy every living creature on this planet. Now, if any of you have ever seen that movie with uh, Gregory Peck, years ago called On the Beach. He was a submariner and he was in the war where that happened. And it did, it destroyed every living thing on this planet. So don't let it happen again, no matter what you have to do to prevent it. What would you want to say to all the men who were killed overseas in the war? What would you want them to know? Buddies, 
you gave your best. We can't praise you enough. I know personally what you went through. I was just lucky enough to miss it. And God bless you all. Well, I want to be remembered as someone who loves his fellow man. And I don't care where you live, what your color is. If, if you're just as friendly with your people around you as I am with the people around me, you're living the right life. That's what would stop every bad thing from happening. Nobody would have a bad life if they all felt like I do uh, to each other. When you were a medic, would you say anything to the men as you were helping patch them up? Words of encouragement or anything? Is there anything that you would talk, say to them? <clears throat> well, it depended on how badly they were hurt. <clears throat> and uh, yes, I would, I would tell them that when you get to the aid station, the doctor so-and-so, captain so-and-so, is going to fix you up in good shape. So just tough it out on the way down the mountain and you'll be great. Would you ever try to make a serious wound not seem that serious? Frankly, I don't remember if I ever did. I, I didn't discuss them too much unless they started asking me questions about it. I would just try to do what the best thing I thought I could do and, and not give him much knowledge about the actual uh, part, uh, part of it. And can, can you elaborate a little bit on the incident that led you to receive the Silver Star? Well, I think probably it, uh, the, the guy who uh, put me in for it was the sergeant who opened the door to the, to the uh, basement and said, come on, Doc, we're leaving. And I told him I can't leave. Uh, he thought I was doing something pretty, pretty good, I think. Is that what you got the Silver Star for, for yes. staying with Ben? Well, th yes, it was part of that. And my running across the street in spite of the machine gun uh, four, three or four times that day. But so, that was the day that you got it for, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, besides the men that we've talked about, were there other names of men that you remember that were killed from your outfit? Oh, yes. <clears throat> well, uh, when I was uh, in the second uh, part of the uh, company, uh, my lieutenant was uh, promoted to captain of the whole co company. And we got a new guy. Uh, uh, Gee, I, I had his name on my tongue just a moment ago. Anyway, he was shot right through the head one day. But the poor guy, I could see, you know, I, I, considering that I had to be in a place where every, any, any platoon could, could call on me to come and help him, I had to be near the, the uh, captain of the company most of the time. And uh, this this chap was scared. He 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 was shaking when I was with him, um, and he he didn't say a word about being that way. But he and he tried to cover it up. I'm sure, but I I felt so sorry for the poor guy, and I wondered if I should suggest something to do him, but what for him to do? But what would that mean? And would it help even if it if it did mean something? So I never said anything to him. But I'll tell you something I just remembered. Before, when we were in Italy, very early on in Italy, there was a guy that came to me, um, and his, his name, I, I'll come up with it in a minute, because he contacted me after the end of the war when I was here and to say he had been trying to get, see if I was, had, been, had survived and if I was available to, anywhere in the country up for, for about 10 years he'd been looking, or more than that, I guess. And his name was Gassaway. And he had come to me 
in, in the mountains in Italy one day and said, Doc, I can't take this anymore. He said, I, I don't want to appear afraid or get so hard that I'd run away and have everybody call me a coward, but I just can't do it anymore. And maybe it's best if, if I'm not here that everybody see how, how I'm, what I am. He said, could you help me in any way? And I said, yeah, I, I can, I'll give it a try. So the next time I had occasion to be down in the aid station, maybe getting more uh, medications for my, my work. And I told the uh, medic there that this guy, Gassaway, is, is just in, in terribly bad shape. And he, it's not the kind of guy that's gonna help our country I mean, our company worth a darn. If you could somehow find out a way to get him transferred somewhere else, we would all appreciate it very much. And apparently it did happen because I never saw him again. I never knew about it until he apparently found out my address here somehow and sent me a letter and thanked me for saving his life. <laughs> wow. Who was the one that was shaking? The, the lieutenant. That got shot. Yeah, yeah uh, the other guy wasn't at that time, yeah. And he wasn't shaking when he was shot, but when, before he was shot, any time I was with him and, and there was a little fighting going on, he'd be shaking like that and, and, and hard to talk, you know. Oh, and then he, he just got, then he was killed. Yeah. Do you remember his name? Turner, Lieutenant Turner. And how old would you say he was? Oh, he was at least 10 years older than I was. That would have made him, I don't know, maybe even, maybe he was even in his 30s. I wouldn't doubt it. <laughs> thank you so much for taking the oh, time. Oh, thank you.